I've lived a pretty rough life. Not rough because it had to be, it's rough because I chose uh, to do things that were outside of what God would intend for me to do. I spent about 30 years of my life in prison, reform school as a kid, uh, so many things that I experienced down through the years that I didn't have to based on bad decisions. Otherwise, I had a good family, a good solid family. Uh, I had a wonderful home, you know. My mom worked, my stepdad worked, had a wonderful stepfather. Matter of fact, this man through uh, example showed me how a man can love and treat other people's children, those who are not his own. My brother and I were there when he and my mom married but he never made a difference. He and my mother had four kids together. There was never a difference made between the two of us and his four children. And so I always loved him. I loved my father also, but I loved him. But I had a wonderful family life. It's just that I was drawn away, as the Bible say, by my own lust. Even in those, I didn't realize what it was, but I thought I just wanted to be with my friends, these people that I thought were my friends. During those times that I grew up in the 40s and 50s, uh, segregation was very prevalent. That was a thing back in those days that when you went uptown, uh, you had to step off the sidewalk for white folks, you know, they coming down the street. I never knew why. I don't know that I really realized the impact because it had always been that way. Now, the one thing that I did realize, and in hindsight, you know everything is 2020. I, I took my lead from my grandfather, who was pretty much my hero. Uh, he was well respected, you know, people knew him all over the city. Uh, you know, he had lots of friends, black and white, at that time. But, but see, one of the things that we have to realize that those, in those days, our mothers and grandmothers and fathers and grandfathers, for that matter, were very protective, especially of black children, men, the boys, because what they were trying to do is give us a survival tool in that particular instance. They wanted us to be able to, there were certain things that you were not allowed to do that other people were. If you did them, you got in trouble. If, if they did them, they didn't. So there was a distinction made. I found that out early, you know, because again, they were giving us survival to. And I remember that this white girl named Ruby took a liking to me. And I, I foolishly gave her my phone number. <laughs> and uh, she called the house and my mama answered the phone and told her don't never call her house no more. And she told me, she said, what are you trying to do? Get killed? You want to be hung? You stay away from the white girl. And uh, uh, it was off limits. And these were, these were things that I didn't fully understand or why, but I knew that, that there were some things that I wasn't allowed to do, and there were other things that I wasn't allowed to do, and I didn't necessarily know why. Uh, but I took on the street persona at an early age. I remember around nine or 10 years old, this guy that was, I guess he might have been 18 or 19 years old. Uh, he and his dad both were dope fiends. They was heroin addicts. And, uh, but he sold marijuana in order to, to support his habit. And since I was out there, he hooked me up, you know, in terms of, of telling me about it and showing me this and that and the other. And then he had me selling it because in Texas at that time, if you were of age and you got busted with a doobie, you got five to 99 a life. But as a juvenile, if they busted me, I was just gonna go to the reform school for a few months. So he called himself using me and, and I give him all the money, see? As I sell the weed, now he just give me a joint or two, you know, for me to smoke with my friends. So that's when I started smoking marijuana. Uh, yeah, yeah, around 10, but 
You know, I learned a, a lot about how people will use you without any regard to what the consequence is going to be for you, but it's always to benefit them. But I wanted to be accepted and I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be cool and I wanted to be part of this mix. And so that's why I ended up at an early age getting in that particular mode. And I, you know, I try to tell kids today, be a leader, not a follower, because everybody is not, does not have your best interest at heart. One of my first run-ins with the law was, I guess, around 1951. Uh, me and a couple of guys burglarized this place. And burglary never was really my thing, but uh, I was little, I was small for my, for my age. And so the place that they wanted to break into, the window only went up so far. They couldn't get in because they were older than me, but I could. So I went in, got the money out of the, they told me where the money box was and all that stuff. Got the money and brought it back, gave it to them. And then, but it was a lady that lived right next door that saw us. We didn't know this. And uh, so when the bus came down, when we got busted, I took the case. And uh, you know, I said, I did it by myself. And they weren't with me and I met them up on the track. And they, because they were friends of mine, I shared the money with them. Well, uh, the police wasn't, but didn't go for it. But, but there was nothing they could do because I wouldn't give them up. <clears throat> uh, when I went to court, uh, the, the judge sat and told my grandfather, he said, your, your grandson is, is a fool. He said, now, he, he, all three of us is in court now. He said, now, he, these two guys are sitting here, and they know that they are just as guilty as he is, but they're not going to speak up. They're going to let him take the case and go to Gatesville, which is, was a reform school, and uh, in a few months, they'll be down there with him. Say, but you, I'm just showing you, he's thinking he's being law and he's really being stupid. Uh, I couldn't see that. So I got a reputation for being law. I wouldn't snitch. I wouldn't get nobody up. And, uh, and I, would take the, I, I would take whatever was coming. You know, I wasn't going to put no, uh, uh, have, have nobody else suffer. You know what I'm saying? If I, anybody had to suffer, I, I'll be the one. I'll sacrifice, my, I'll sacrifice myself, you know? And I did that on a dumb occasions. 1961 was my first time in prison for burglary. I had three years. Uh, I became extremely bitter in prison because at those times, you see these slave movies and all of that stuff. Texas penitentiary was just like being on a plantation. They ran it, they ran the system, the Texas prison system, which is now they're giving them most more fancy name. But back then it was a Texas prison system. And it was uh, basically agriculture. They, they were self-sustaining, they grew all their own food. So they had free labor. You had to work in the fields, you know, 10, 12 hours every day. Uh, they drove you like, like slaves, they had whips like slaves, they, they, you know, he got beat with hoe hounds and ax hounds and, and all those types of things just for talking while you were out there working. Thank God that never happened to me. Uh, I was, God always put me in a place where I found favor with, with, with those that were in, in, in authority. Uh, I, was, I was not one to be, uh, you know, disrespectful. Uh, the only time maybe I got disrespectful when people disrespected me. But I knew how to not get myself caught up uh, in acting stupid and ignorant. You know, I, I done done wrong, I'm in the penitentiary now, so I gotta do what I gotta do. Right, so I, I, I worked hard, didn't know anything about agriculture, uh, had never worked on a farm, never, I had, my grandfather tried to teach me how to pick cotton, I didn't learn until I got to prison. Uh, and I worked, I mean, they worked. It wasn't no play thing. I mean, it was a, you, 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 you ran up and down them roads, you worked hard every day. I mean, I mean, work, construction workers didn't work hard as we worked. Uh, 
I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, I've been with men uh, that we carry covers. You know, I mean, big cup, covers big enough for you to walk through. We loaded, unloaded, and loaded them by hand. They didn't have uh, cranes and all that stuff. We were the cranes. Uh, I told them, the officer, when I first went to the field, I said, sir, I don't know nothing about corn. We were chopping corn. I said, I don't know nothing about corn. Nothing but how to eat it. That's it. And all the corn was, if corn was up now, it's about six inches tall. Well, Johnson grass looks just like corn. And so the man is hollering, get the grass out of my corn. So I'm chopping everything down. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know Johnson grass from corn. I, I, I'm just, this is the first time I've ever been to the field. I don't know what I'm doing. I said, sir, if somebody would show me what to do, I'll do it. And I guess the sincerity in my voice let him know I wasn't trying to be smart or nothing like that. And I didn't get disciplined or nothing for it. They showed me. Now within a year, six, eight months, or to a year, I was one of the best workers out there. Uh, they, uh, wherefore, they made me a lead row, what they call a lead row, which is the guy on the first row. Everybody else worked off of me. You know, I had learned just that quick because I found out when you learn how to do something well, you don't get no flack about it. And, I, and one of the verses, one of the things in the Bible that I, that I always held on to was work as unto the Lord, which means that you do the best that you possibly can just like Christ is standing there. And you're doing it for him.